Week three, you excited? We're learning, we're learning about the goat. We're learning about the greatest of all time, amen? And who is it? It's Jesus, that's exactly right. So tonight what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some steps. Jesus left us a little imprint. He showed us how to find this greatness. Of course, what we want to do tonight is, is continue to exalt in the Lord. We want to exalt. We want it, we want everyone to know. We want the principalities and powers. We want the angels. We want everyone beside us, everybody in the world to know that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? And yet he tells us, he says, look, follow me. Isn't that right? And so in following Christ, there is a fruit. There is something wonderful that is awaiting us that he wants us to have. And so we're learning about this. So tonight we're going to talk about building a foundation for greatness. Building a foundation. Jesus shows us how to do that. So I wanted to begin with kind of taking just a little snapshot of the past, just real quickly, because we're going to see that what Jesus did was prefigure some of the points I'm going to share with you tonight. First of all, we're going to talk about belief and faith. And in the scriptures, obviously, the one who most characterizes belief and faith for us is Abraham. Abraham believed God, didn't he? He listened to what God had to say. God had a plan. God had an enormous plan to bless all the nations through him. And what was, but what was so amazing about Abraham? What was he known for? He believed God, didn't he? He believed God. God said, look, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. He just threw it out there. He's childless. There's absolutely no way in, in, in the human mentality that that could ever happen the way he was and the way he and Sarah were and childless and yet he believed God and the Bible tells us it was credited to him as righteousness so belief and faith secondly we see in scripture obedience and I think of David when I think of obedience what is said of him is that David was a man after God's own heart but he also said I love David I'm for David and why he said because he does what I tell him to do he does he, everything that is on my heart is on David's heart and David went about doing it so another, another thing we see in Scripture and then the third thing is speech or declaration we talk about the prophets don't we and we could focus on so many of them or you know just a few but the one I think of is the one we studied this past year and that of course is Isaiah Isaiah was the one when God was speaking and saying you know, the, the world is, is, is lying dormant. The, the world is in need of, of being told of the goodness of God in the land of the living. And Isaiah's watching it. And he says, here I am, Lord, send me. But he didn't just say, send me. He said, I, you can use my mouth. And so he gave him the scroll. You know the image. And he, and he ate the scroll. And he swallowed. And it was, of course, sweet to the taste and sour to the stomach. Because that was the message, of course. It was a message coming from God, but it, of course, was going to be a, a, a strong message. It was going to be a message hard for the people to hear. But that, that, that's it. So what I see in Scripture is three basic things that we're going to find that Jesus exemplified for us, and then he's handing the baton to us. And we'll talk about all those tonight. So what did Jesus do? What did he do to earn such a wonderful place in God's heart? Well, we read about that last week, Philippians, or at least we, we referred to it in the last two weeks. In Philippians chapter 2, right, it says that he was out of obedience. It was that he did not see equality with God as something to be grasped. He came as a servant. But more than anything, folks, what he did was he obeyed, didn't he? He did what the Father wanted him to do. And then in Matthew chapter 6, he says something that in my mind absolutely encapsulates everything that Jesus wanted us to know, right there in Matthew 6, 33. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. What Jesus is telling us, he's actually telling them, look, if you want to succeed in this life, you make the kingdom of God first. We'll come back to that, unpack that just a little bit more. But what I want you to see tonight, when we look at Jesus as the goat, his message is absolutely encapsulated in this statement right here. Because he, just, he wasn't just telling them. It's something that he himself believed. It is something that he exemplified with every step he took, every decision he made, and everything that he did in following God and following the Father. 
And so he's telling us the same thing. He's looking at us and saying, if you want to experience greatness, if you want to experience my, God's favor, the Father's favor and blessing on your life, seek first the kingdom. Seek a relationship with him and watch God bless everything in your life. That's just what I would call Jesus' core truth right there. That was his core message. Seek first the kingdom of God. And everything flowed out of that. So Jesus, in every way, followed the patriarchs. He followed the prophets with great precision. His path to greatness was prefigured in, the God, in God's closest allies. In other words, folks, here's the beautiful thing. What God wants us to do, he has shown us over and over and over again. It's not a confusing path, actually. It's only three steps. Well, you know, I've been told I need to stick it to, keep it to just three points. So it's just a, a three-step tango tonight, all right? Could be four. Maybe end up being five, but I'll try to keep it to three. But the reality is this. It is something he has set out in front of us. It's the Calvary Road. But you know what? That's a tough road. That's a whole other sermon series. But what I want to talk about is the kingdom path. The kingdom path, which again, Jesus has shown us very clearly. So let's take a look at those three points in a little more specificity tonight. Number one, believe. Let's talk about belief tonight. You know, the Father says of Jesus, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. Well, that's good, isn't it? Why? Why was God, why did God love his son so much? Why did he love Jesus? Well, you see it all all throughout the New Testament. It makes it pretty clear right here. The fact is that Jesus embraced the path that was laid out for him. He came to the earth. He didn't just come and say, okay, Father, now I kind of got a different idea of how we're going to do this. I mean, you know, I've been looking at your plan. I'm kind of thinking I don't have to die. I'm kind of thinking maybe there's a better way that we can do this to defeat the enemy. You know, I've just come up with a different set of plans. What do you think? That's not what happened. In fact, what we read in Hebrews chapter 10, in verse 9 and 10, says this. Then he said, this is Jesus, here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by the will, and by that will. Now, this is, we're going to come back to this as well. Mark this. By that will. Now, that, that word will in the Greek is thelema. Okay? And we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the blood um, of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. It was through this will. Isn't that interesting? It was, it was his decision. It was his belief in what he knew was on the Father's heart that released what it was his core belief, to seek first the kingdom of God. So it wasn't just words to him. It wasn't just telling those guys, those disciples, they're going, hey, how can we be greatest in the kingdom? How can we be blessed in this world? Well, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. Uh Uh-uh. He showed them how to do it, didn't he? He walked in this belief. So I want you to think about it. Jesus read the scriptures about himself, didn't he? He read the whole book of Isaiah. He read through the Psalms. He knew what he had to do. He saw him himself written out there, how he was going to have to suffer, how he was going to have to do and follow the purposes of God. But he also read the glorious ending, didn't he? He knew that what he did was going to win the nations back to the Father. He knew he was going to be the reconciling agent, the second Adam, to transform this world, to grab it. Last week, remember, we were talking about the jurisdiction of the devil and how he used to have the world. He used to be of the power of the prince of the air, but not anymore. Not because of what Jesus did for us. And so he had to read what was in the script. He had to read the whole plan, didn't he? And so he's going, I mean, can you imagine that? Sitting there reading through the book of Isaiah, reading the Psalms, reading Ezekiel, Jeremiah, especially Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, and knowing that was you. Knowing that was you. What does the Bible tell us? He believed God. He believed the Father. And he says, Father, here I am. I'm here to do your will. I'm here, and I believe that what you're telling me is true. I believe that through the door and the pathway of this this suffering, 
Okay, we can't, we can't get around that. There was some suffering that he had to endure. He had to endure the, the persecution, right? He had to endure the snide remarks. He had to, you know, he had to endure all these people who he created, by the way. Treat him like dirt. And then murder him as a criminal, and he did none of it. He, he, did, he was undeserving of that. So he had to look at that plan, and what did he have to do? He had to believe God. That he, to, to endure all that, all that suffering and all that shame for the glory that was set before him, for the joy that was set before him. Now, that's wonderful when we think of Jesus. But I want to remind you all that, folks, that's our first step to achieving the greatness that God has, that God has for us. Our first step is believing that what God says about you and me is true. That we believe that those promises are yes and amen for us. The moment you give your life to Jesus Christ, that whole book, of course, I got it all here on this thing, so it's not so impressive. But if I had a nice big old fat KJV right here, just as big as you could get it. I mean, you know, large, large print for us who can't see. And just held that up to you and said, every one of these promises in this book is yours. It's yes and amen to you. What's the, what's the key? you got to believe it, don't you? Because that's all they are is just words. That's all it is is a book. All it is is just a lot of wonderful symbols and types and prophetic sayings and unctions and, and plans and peoples and all of it. But when you put on the, 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 the helmet of salvation, you put on the understanding that that is all yours, whew, it's an amazing process. It's, it's, it comes to life. No, ma no wonder there's so much joy. No wonder there's so much anticipation. No wonder if, that if we, have the pe as the people of God, take that first step in believing, man, what could potentially come our way? God's greatness, that's what's coming your way. So, so to start down the path of God's will for your life, you must first implicitly believe that God has a perfect will for you. It's not a career counselor's suggestion, okay? It's not you walk into the office of God and God's got six possible things for you. You know, we could go with the, uh, the gold plan for you. This is, you know, my gold plan. And we got this little bronze down here. You know, I, you know, I think I'll take the bronze. No, you don't want that. You want the best for, your, for God, God for your life. Amen? Come on, tell me amen. You, I preach faster when you do that, so help me out here. All right? Amen, of course that's what you want. You want God's best for your life. It's God's philema for you. Remember that Greek word? You know what philema means in the Greek? It means the preferred will of God. You're going to love this, Jamie. The preferred will of God. That kind of answers some questions about maybe some of the pathways that we take on our own. Because sometimes we do take the B plan or even the C plan. And God is saying, I sure wish you'd, you'd take the A plan I have for you because that's my preferred will for you. Paul said the same thing there in Romans chapter 12, didn't he? He says, God's got a good will for you. And you can discover what that will. And, and, and he used three words to describe what the will of God was. His good, his pleasing, and his what? Perfect will for you. So there it is. It's waiting. It's waiting for us. But how do we get it? Well, step one is what? Believing. Believing. Now, that may seem as simple as, as just, well, yeah, I believe it. But belief takes another step, doesn't it? It's only the first step. That's only the first step towards what God has for you. And it's, it's, it's a good step for you. To follow Christ means to take God at his word for you. Not just for everybody else, not just for the people that were in the Bible, but for you. Now let me ask you a question. What has God said about you? What has God said? Do you know those promises? And I, I just want to release you. Turn you loose to go get them. But here's just a, a few. I love Philippians 4.13. I and mean, this is kind of one, the catch-all one. I can do all things. Well, that's I can do all this through him who gives me strength. But I like the other translation, which says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Yeah, I'm looking up going, what, what's that? 
It's so funny when you memorize scriptures, you know, so many years ago. I used to have the pocket scriptures. It was called the pocket promises. And all through high school, man, I just would sit, sit there and just memorize and memorize and memorize. And some of those early verses, I'll never remember them a different way, ever. Because that's when they were imprinted into my soul. But anyway, I can do all things, amen? I can do only some things. I can do, you know, partially. Uh-uh. I can do all things. And that is a part of the perfect plan that God has for your life. And that's pretty cool. If you just, just turn that loose for a moment here. Just turn it loose in the way of faith. And it can absolutely steamroll over any of the things that are, you're, that are facing you right now. Steamroll all of the fears and the struggles and the, wonder, the wonders about what's going to happen tomorrow or the year after that. It just steams roll when you know that whatever comes your way, God's got a plan for it. See, here's the problem is a lot of us want you know, to live according to what we see rather than live according to what God has got planned for you. Folks, those are some profound words, man. I'm, I'm telling you right now, you need to sit on that for a little while. He has a plan. Because he's what? He's God. And what does God know? Well, God knows all things. And when did God know it? He's always known it. He knew you before one, every, one day ever came to be. Read, read Psalm 31, 30, 139. And Jesus told us that. He said, the Father knows every hair in your head. What are you worrying about? Every day has its grace for today. Give it to him. Romans 3, 22. And this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. There is no distinction. Aren't those great words there at the end? There's no distinction. We don't earn it according to anything that we've done. The doorway, I love what Jesus said. You've heard me say it here before. He said, what are the works that God requires? Who remembers? Believe. 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 We have the mind of Christ. I love 1 Corinthians 2, 16. Therefore, we have a li- access to a life-changing grace. I love this verse. We have been given the mind of Christ. So there it is. The moment you open your heart to the promises of God and you let him into, you start thinking about God, he will come in there by the Holy Spirit begin to transform your mind to help you focus more on the promises of God, to begin loading up and giving even more strength. To, you know, we talk about find and replace with, with computers, right? You go, you put put a word in and it'll find it. You want to replace it with a different word? You know, have you ever done any word processing that way? Well, that's the way it works by the Spirit of God. Unbelief, find and replace. Every place I do not trust God, Lord, find it, remove it, and replace it with I believe you. I believe that I can do all things in you for your glory. The second step, folks, well, your Christ-following journey began... Oh, this is an important point. I guess I need to stick to the notes because they're good. Anyway, uh, your Christ-following journey began with belief, didn't it? When you came to Jesus Christ. I mean, you didn't come to Jesus, somebody put you in a headlock, believe, come on, okay, I believe. No, you, you willingly gave your heart to him, didn't you? And how'd you do that? You believed him. Somebody told you the gospel, whether it was in third grade, 12th grade, or just last week. You believed the gospel. The rest of your faith, the rest of your walk is based on that very same faith. Very same faith. That's important to remember right there. Because see, a lot of us get our salvation and we think, okay, I'm good. I got what I need. And now I can do the rest of my life the way I want to do my rest of my life. How many know that is really a very losing mentality. You can raise your hand if you want to. God bless you. I'll raise mine because I know it's true. Maybe you tried it out. Well, we all have to some degree or another. We all have. The same faith that you came to Jesus Christ with is the same faith you're going to use and walk in for the rest of your Jesus journey. Second point, second step is obey, to obey. What did Jesus said, say? He says, I do what I see the Father doing. Jesus didn't just come down, right? Set up shop and, be, and just said, hey, you know, I'm going to be here all week, man. You can come and worship me. 
He didn't do that, did he? What did he do? He went out and he destroyed the works of the devil. We talked about that last week. He, what did he do? He did. He was doing. He was a kingdom. He came to bring the kingdom of God. And so he, he, he and, that's, and why was he doing that? Because that's what the Father was doing. I only do what the Father is doing. Okay, come on, folks. This doesn't take, you know, rocket science, you know, ability to figure this out. What Jesus was doing was what the Father was doing. It's what the Father wanted to be done. Son, I want you to go to the earth and I want you to kick Satan's butt over and over again. I want you to drive him out. I want you to defeat him. And I want you to take back what was ours. Not only for us, because we created it. Right? In the beginning, let us make man in our own image. To get it all back for us. And then to give it back. To give it back to all the Adam and Eves who've been waiting to get it back. That's what he did. So how did he do it? Well, he had to obey, folks. He had to come and do it. Listen to John 5, 19. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do, mark it, only what he sees the father, what? Doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. It's a matter of action, folks. And, you know, I hate to put it, you know, quite simply. But sometimes we do need it simply presented to us again to get us back on track. We've got to be doing the will of God, okay? We can't just walk, talk about the will of God. So many things. That's the next step in this journey. Jesus showed us how to do it. The ancients were commended for doing, not just believing. David was beloved by God because he would do what it was on the Father's heart. And that's why Father loved David. He was like, man, that David, he always is doing what is on my heart. And what was on the Father's heart was to go and to destroy the works of the devil, to advance the kingdom of God, and then pass it off to some disciples so they would continue to do it. What? Do it. It is a doing thing, folks. So we have to ask ourselves that question. What are we doing? Are we advancing the kingdom of God? Do you even know that you can? Of course you can. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. He doesn't say, I can think all things through Christ who, think, you know, who strengthens me. No, he says, you can do. See, aren't we tired of all the talk? I mean, some of you grew up in the church, and you heard a lot of talk. And, and, and perhaps you've been in church long enough to hear enough sermons to go after a while to just start scratching your head. Hey, when does this stuff actually work? When does this stuff we've been talking about all the time actually change our lives? When can I actually go out and know that the devil was defeated? When can I see people being set free from the bondages they experience? When can I see the outpouring of God that, that I know can happen? You know, the beautiful thing, folks, is you know, it's happening here. Ten baptisms. What was it last week? Last week? We had eight before we even announced that. It's going to be absolutely out of control on Easter. And that's awesome. Isn't that awesome? And we're only getting started. We're only getting started for what I believe God has coming. Hebrews 5, 8 and 9. During the days of Jesus' earthly life, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Folks, obedience is rather important when it comes to the kingdom of God. It just is. Okay? You know, the, the, the very attributes about God that we all love are the attributes that in some ways we have to get past. God is not going to come and make you do anything. At least that's what I have found. And you know what? As pastors, sometimes we, can, we, we feel motivated to try to step into that role, to 
scare people into the kingdom of God, to threaten people to do the things of God, to chase people <laughs> to do things. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Because if, if, it's not in, if you don't believe it, then you're not going to do it. But once you believe it, then, it, then it, ta- it does take a little bit of encouragement. It does take a little of encouragement to, to start doing it. Now, we look at Jesus' ex- example. Now, guess what? It cost him. Nobody said this kingdom of God stuff was easy, okay? Sometimes you've got to get up early if you want to go to the, you know, and, and, and give your Saturday to go give away food, right? I mean, you've got to give that to him. And, and sometimes it's going to cost you to just say, you know, come, you know, I don't care if they got tornado warnings. I'm going to church, man. No, that may be stupid, but, you know, at the same time, yeah. <laughs> that goes really well on on a Thursday night, and you all just did that, right? I mean, you're now all just sitting there back, yeah, man. I'm... Yeah, we got the brownie points in the spirit there. We're, we're good. <laughs> God bless you. The kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. We learned that last week. And how do we gain power? God only gives power to the things we are called to do and anointed to do. Remember those words. Remember them. God gives power to what you've been called to do and what you're anointed to do. So if you're spending a lot of time doing things that God has not called you to do and have not been anointed to do, then do not be surprised if there's no power there. Don't be surprised. Now, I could get into lots of detail on that, but I'm going to let you figure that part out. You just ask God. But what I am really talking about are those things in this life that are not born in the heart of God. Those things that you know that God has called you to do. And, and how do you know it? Well, you've got to go back to step one, right? You've got to believe what God, you know God is saying to you and, and has spoken to you, what called you to do. And then you obey it and you walk in it, whether it's tough or not. Well, it's going to be tough, okay? It's going to be tough. To become the goat, you've you, you got to put your time in, man. You're going to suffer a little bit. We see it in the world. I mean, you don't get up there and stand on the, on the stand and get the gold medal to just say, yeah, it was really crazy, man. I just, last week I thought about swimming and I came out and won the gold medal. It was ridiculous, you know. <laughs> That's not the way it works. You got to work your tail off and there's suffering and, there's, and there's, there's days you want to give up and not do it anymore. That's, these things translate spiritually, do they not? They absolutely do. That means I'm going to read his Bible. I'm going to read the Word. I'm going to read it. I'd rather be watching that TV show right now. Or I'd rather sleep in for another hour. Or I'd rather do a million other things than to sit down and read the Bible. The Word of God is near you. It's in your mouth. You speak it. You read it. And it's that. that's the raw material God uses to begin helping you in this journey. Seeking the first the kingdom of God, folks, is the recipe for a very blessed life. I'm telling you. I know it by having missed it, and I know it for having found it. And when, and any time I've ever just said, Lord, this is what I want to do, but, but your will be done. Your will be done in my life. The choice that I know I need to make here I don't, but my flesh is saying I want to do this, but you're saying for me to do that. Okay, Lord, I'm, I'm breaking my will to do your will. I'm going to seek first your kingdom. Folks, listen to the energy. Listen to the pain. Listen to the, and, and see the struggle in it. Seek first his kingdom. There are so many other things that we could so easily put in there. In fact, if you take a minute and think about it, there probably are some things that are already there. Got to go. If you want to experience the absolute glorious blessing that you are hoping for, that God has said he wants you to have, that's the doorway. James said that faith without works is dead. In Ephesians chapter 2, it says that we are Christ's works, work, workmanship, prepared to do good works. The good works that he has planned for us, they're, they're, they're prepared waiting, sitting on the shelf. Ready for us to just walk up and say, okay, ready to do it. Isn't that amazing? Folks, we'll finish with this. And then, of course, uh, with the last point, 
But humility is always the key when it comes to obedience. And here's the thing. I have found is that when we submit our will, grace comes pouring in to help us with that decision. Isn't that good? I mean, a lot of times God says, look, I'm going to carry you the rest of the way. I mean, don't count on it. But 99% of the time, I have found that to be true. When I say, Lord, not my will, but yours be. Your kingdom come. Your will. I'm ready to seek first your kingdom. And then those first few steps in that direction, God comes and says, I got you. It's all right, David. What I was looking for was humility. What I was looking for you was belief and obedience. And because I'm the one who does it in you anyway, I'm going to carry you. I'm going to make this happen through you. So, folks, what I wanted you to catch in that second step is it's, it's, it's more, it is the doing, but it's more of the will that is surrendered to the plan that God has for your life. And by surrendering to it, what do you do? You have to do it, right? You have to do it. I thought of another little analogy here, but for the sake of time, I'm going to move on. Number three is proclaim. Proclaim. The Bible tells us, Jesus told us, he says, look, the time is going to come and I'm going to give you. You're, you're going to be in pressure, you're going to be persecuted when you start believing me and when you start obeying and doing what I've called you to do, you're going to be persecuted and you're, gonna, you, you're not going to know what to say. He says, but I'm going to give you the words. I'm going to give you the words. So folks, this, this is the third step in ex experiencing greatness. Is number one, you believe what God has said about you. Ne number two, you start walking with what, in, in what God has said uh, you're going to do through obedience. And then finally, you're going to tell everybody about it. And folks, I'm going to tell you, that may seem like the least important thing. Oh, no. It is absolutely the most critical piece of where we are in the world today. Far too many Christians are not speaking. Far too many Christians are not telling people about what it is that God has done in their life. The Bible tells us, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And when we hide that testimony, this verse comes to my mind. How can, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe? First step. How can they find the first step? Unless they've heard. And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? Doing. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news? But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word about Christ. Folks, how will they know in this world unless we tell them? There is much more at stake than just our worldly desires and even our own reputations when it comes to speaking. And we're in a tight spot right now where it's not so popular to be a Christian. In fact, the enemy is ramping up. But you know what? <laughs> I want to encourage you, because whenever the enemy tries to ramp up against the blood-bought people of God, kingdom-owning people of God, oh, man, he's doomed. Oh, he's doomed. He's not going to succeed. He already got his tail whipped. And, the, and Satan always overplays his hand. The only way you lose this fight is by giving up. The only way you lose this battle is you get off the line. The only way you do not experience God's best for your life is if you stop believing it. But it means we've got to go into the fray. And you know what? The beautiful part about that is there's wonderful things awaiting us. Miracles, surprising things. God bailing us out of messes. God coming in and doing incredible things in our lives and, and through us. But folks, we've got to open our mouth. We sing that song, This Is My Testimony. Isn't that a great song? And he says, and, and you know, every time we sing that little, that little chorus there, I, I'm a little uncomfortable. So, you know, if I'm not dead, you know, then it means you've got something more to me to do. And I'm thinking, well, there's been a lot of death and people talking about death of late, but it's still true, doggone it. If we're still here, there's so much there, and that is the, the reality of the providence of God. If we're still here, then it means he's got more for us to do. And he's got more for us to say. 
So the prophets, God came to the prophets and said, look, I want you to tell the world what I'm getting ready to do. Folks, it's time for us to open our mouths. Because if we believe him, and if we obey him and start seeing some wonderful, miraculous things happen through our life, we've got to tell somebody about it. Because everybody out there in the world is absolutely disillusioned. Everybody out there thinks that this world is broken and it gives nothing in return. Well, that's true. They need to know that there's a creator, that there's a God who loves them, that there's a God who does have a kingdom, wonderful, blessed life for them to experience. We need to tell them about it. Uh, but, 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 but we need to experience experience it too right this is my testimony do you got a testimony then tell people about it get out there don't have a testimony well go back to those first two steps all right you know you walk up to the off you know the office it reminds me of a a, a comedy you know skit you walk up and say you know you, you know you're looking for a testimony well you go down two offices down you, you start with belief you gotta go there first it's so true I believe, therefore, I have spoken. That's what belief does. How do you know that you really believe something? You tell people about it, right? You buy a new truck. If you thought you made a good idea, you made a decision, you're going to tell everybody you made a good decision. If you didn't, you're going to keep it in the garage and not talk much about it. <laughs> right? It was like the Yugo. Anybody ever heard of the Yugo? Some of you probably did. Yeah, I'm, that's kind of a special car to us up in Michigan because one actually got blown off the Mackinac Bridge. Yeah, anyway, I, I shouldn't have said special. I mean, it, it, it's unique. <laughs> Sorry, Steve. Uh, anyway, folks, this is the deal. When all three of these spiritual steps are engaged, then greatness is on the way. It's on the way, man. You're, you're on the conveyor belt. You're, you're in the slipstream of greatness for your life. You continue to believe what God has said about you. You continue to obey what he wants you to do and walk in it and begin to tell everybody about it. And I'm telling you, folks, doors are going to be open. God is going to say, look, now there's one who's faithful. There's one who I can entrust my blessing with. You ever wonder why God doesn't bless certain people as much? Well, number one, he's not sure he can entrust that with them. And two, they're not going to tell anybody about it. You want to be blessed? You want to experience greatness in God? Then be trustworthy with that. Be trustworthy that if he does something for you gloriously, man, get out there and tell everybody about it. Get out there and tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell your friend or your, your family. Write it on a blog. Tell people on Facebook and Twitter. Get it out there, man. Tell people about the wonderful things that God has done in your life. And keep telling them. And watch God continue to give you more. Now, there, there's a spiritual principle there, right? You can't outgive God. You can't outwork God. You can't outbelieve God. I guarantee you that. So whatever God has done in your life, give it away. Pour it out. Tell people about it. And watch God just say, no, again, that's the one that I'm going to keep pouring it through. Amen? Amen. Let's stand up tonight. Amen. Good. Amen. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes tonight. Amen. Lord Jesus, you showed us the way. You are the goat, the greatest of all time. But you're great for a reason. You believed the Father. You obeyed the Father and did what he called you to do. And then you walked around for three whole years telling people how they could be blessed. How you and your Father were one how that brought you such great joy. Lord, we've got to look forward to heaven and we know we're blessed. We have that assurance. So many who don't have it. Lord, impassion us in these days to speak. So Lord, bless us. Keep us. Make your face shine upon us. 
Lord, lead us. God, these, these simple steps tonight, God, I pray that we would camp on them for a while, that we would just pray. And I pray over all of us right now. We open our hearts, God. And Lord, would you continue to lead us? Help us to believe more, to obey more, to begin speaking more. And Lord, if we haven't even begun, then Lord, may this be a wonderful new step for every one of us or any one of us. And I pray right now, God, just a special blessing on your people tonight. Special favor. A wonderful grace. Because, Lord, as we open our hearts to you, as we say yes and amen tonight, then, Lord, you pour it out. When we humble ourselves into your mighty hand, you pour out grace. And grace is your power, it's your ability to do what it is that you've called us to do. More grace upon us tonight, God. More. In Jesus' wonderful name. If you're here tonight, you're not certain that if you died tonight, you'd go to heaven. Look, the gospel is very simple. It's very wonderful. And you can know confidently. The Bible tells us that it's written, that you might know that you have eternal life. And so we want to help you do that tonight. Don't leave without first help, letting us help you do that. Come on down to the front. One of our pastors will be here to help you take your first baby steps in the kingdom of God. What a wonderful thought. And you can be baptized coming up here soon. So no Lord bless us. Thank you. Lord, we have lifted up worship tonight. God, we have given our tithes and offerings in faith. And Lord, we've listened to a word. May it be all of these things, God. All of these things. Deep in our faith. None of it return void. And every promise would be yes and amen in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you tonight. We'll see you again soon. Love you.